So I had a fantastic long weekend in Columbia, Tennessee at game night playing in a CEDH event and a legacy event. I had an absolutely fantastic time. I am exhausted in the best way possible. So, you know, if we lose matches today, how about we, we blame it on the fact that I'm tired, not on the fact that the deck is sus. Hello folks, Phil Gallagher aka Thraben, you here for another Legacy video, and today I'm going to be playing with a deck that Aaron called Red Black Mana Squeeze. And if you're a fan of like pox and prison and land destruction mana denial style strategies, you're probably going to like this. Uh, so this was a tier 3 donation deck list, so I had to do quite a bit of work to this one. Um, we, we're going to have kind of a conceptual rebuild, but this is what was originally sent to me. The idea is to basically build the deck around Nether Void, which is a really sweet card. It's a world enchantment, so you only get to have one of those. Whenever a player casts a spell, counter it unless that player pays three. And that's pretty neat. It's not something that's really replicated. So this is symmetrical, so this does apply to both players. So the idea was play some spells that can't be countered, that dodge nether void, or otherwise do things like cycling that aren't technically casting a spell, so they get around Nether Void. And the idea was to stack these with effects like Blood Sun, that shut off fetch lands and other utility land abilities, Sorcerer's Spyglass to further hate on the fetch lands, and Sphere of Resistance to tax your opponent out further. But I, I had some problems with this deck. Number one, there's not very many win conditions. Uh, the deck has four Planeswalkers and two Palantirs, and I don't really know that that's enough. And number two, you're, you run into some awkwardness here. So Blood Sun is supposed to have some upside with some of the utility lands that we're playing here. So City of Traders is probably the best example of this, where City of Traders will lose its sacrifice ability, allowing you to keep it around, which means that you can power out your big planeswalkers and stuff. And Lotus Field was here as a secondary way to do that. And if you can start cheating some of the abilities on some things like, say, Rakdos Carnarium, then, yeah, this starts to be kind of cool. But this deck has 28 lands to start with and four spirit guides beyond that. So we are at greater percent, greater than 50% mana production. And in the main deck, we have minimal ways to interact with anything that actually resolves. So if something slips through the lock pieces, um, well, we're kind of fucked. <laughs> There's not really another way to say it. We, we just don't have answers to things, especially if it's some larger creature like Murktide Regent that, that Slice and Dice isn't going to deal with. And while Obliterate is super cool and happens to not hit Planeswalkers or Enchantments, the fact that our Obliterate might be taxed by, say, our own Sphere of Resistance is... It's a little rough. So I did a rebuild. And this is what I came up with. I'm still not 100% happy with it, but I think we're good enough that I can... Oh, I need to update that card. Beautiful. Anyway, I think we're at the point where it's good enough that we can jam a league with it and not be embarrassed. So conceptually, the first thing that I wanted to do was add the ability to interact with creature-based decks. And so now in Legacy, we have eight uncounterable removal spells because you can play four copies of Long Goodbye alongside four copies of Sudden Edict. Now, Sudden Edict has fallen out of the Legacy metagame, primarily because Orcish Bowmasters is currently about 40% of the format, and Edicts that can't select uh, token or non-token like Shoulders Edict can have gotten much worse. So that was thing number one I wanted to do. Thing number two I wanted to do was reduce the number of lands. I think we were on something like 28 lands. I removed some of those lands to add Lotus Petals and more interaction to the deck list. One of my original problems with the deck was that it was relatively win condition light, and 
if we add more removal, it matters less that we don't immediately get to a win condition. I I think the the overall strategy here is kind of weak. I think we're we're trying to do something for the sake of doing it rather than doing something that we think is actively going to be good. So we're going to we're going to go into this league with relatively low expectations. One of the things that I conceptually want for this deck list is Urza's Saga. Like that's the sort of thing that I think would pair really well with like various lock pieces and things that are taxing our opponent's mana. You know, you you create this temporary choke point and you close out the game with Urza Saga construct tokens while you have that choke point available. But that's not going to work so well with cards like Blood Moon and Blood Sun. And I wanted to keep the Blood Suns as I feel like felt like that was something important to the original deck's vision. And this is kind of where I fell. I also added additional uncounterable win conditions in the form of Inferno of Star Mounts. This is something that I played one league with maybe a year or two ago at this point. Um, Caracas is a bit of a liability uh, in regards to this particular card, but it's not like Caracas is super, super common right now, so hopefully it's fine. I'm not really sure what to do with the mana base. I have put something together. Legacy mana bases, generally speaking, are built around the power of fetch lands, allowing you to just play, you know, essentially infinite copies of your dual lands with very little cost associated with them. And this deck doesn't get to do that. And the way that I've built the deck, you need early-ish access to black for removal, but red for blood sun. And you also want most of your lands to produce red mana for Inferno of the Star Mounts to kind of continue to make it a, a good clock. Because, like, fire breathing a couple of times might be the literal difference of a, a turn. So I've tried to keep most of the lands as red-producing lands. That's going to come with some cost in terms of the life total. Um, I have played a Surveil land. It's it's awkward because, like, this is a deck that reasonably could play a couple of Surveil lands if fetch lands were allowed in the mana base, but they're not because of Blood Sun. So again, there's some tension there. And we'll kind of see how this ends up feeling. We've added Caves of Chaos Adventurer to the sideboard for the times that we feel like we need to actually try to win the game. We have some dedicated hate cards for specific combo matchups, and then I've put the Palantirs in as a way to put additional win conditions into the deck versus uh, assorted control decks. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's see how this performs. Uh, maybe I'll be surprised and it's better than I think. And if you like what you see today and you end up needing any magic cards, or maybe you need some pre-orders for Outlaws at Thunder Junction, check out toamagic.com. That is Tales of Adventure. You get free shipping, and it's fast, and you get everything from one seller instead of needing to order from a whole bunch of different places, which we all know is super annoying. So check them out. They also have a sweet selection of legacy cards, Power 9, just about anything that you need. With that being said, let's battle. So fundamentally, something that I talk about, especially when I do tutoring, is that a lot of times a hand that has a lock piece as its primary thing, but doesn't have a follow-up threat, is not a capable hand. Um, keep in mind for this deck in particular, that's not going to be true, as we only have six win conditions. We are settling in for a longer game here, and I think we just have to accept that we're just not going to have win conditions uh, that we can immediately follow up these lock pieces with. So next up, before I get um, a lot of people asking me why I'm not just going for City of Traders right away, this is a land that I would like to preserve for as long as possible because I would like this to be my mana that gets me to six mana. Uh, this is a problem card for me, um, unless we find something like a Blood Sun. Well, we are going to be miserable together. All right. We're just going to bad lands and pass. Sudden Edict costs three mana. Oh, no. Eh. So we, we don't get to use our mana effectively in this turn cycle, which is not necessarily the end of the world. Uh, we'll just be passing the turn here. 
And then after my opponent uses Urza Saga, I will Sudden Edict the token. And I want to do this now. That way I guaranteed deny the attack step that my opponent would have. I don't want them to respond with an activation and then get to get an attack in immediately. Shadow Spear, sure. A lifelink isn't that bad. The, the, the increased damage is more relevant than anything else. Hey, that'll do. Um, am I going to play a City of Traders? Like, does it matter? It doesn't matter right now. It could matter next turn, as I don't actually have the extra mana for Sphere of Resistance. And in theory, this can let me double spell, I guess. But I don't see double spelling being particularly relevant here. So, like, we're surviving. It's it's turn five. My opponent hasn't drawn blood. That's good, but life, more generally speaking, is probably rough. That represents a Dark Depths in a couple of turns. That's not great for me. The good news is I don't actually have to deal all that much damage to my opponent to kill them. Um, this one I probably just hold for a little while. All right, so my opponent is going searching. Opposition Agent would have been a reasonable card to add to this deck, but it's not uncounterable, so it kind of works against the whole Nether Void idea. All right, there is the Dark Depths. It's coming. An Edict doesn't currently stop the 2020. So we could rip running removal spells like that would do it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make a land drop, and I'll just lose the city. I think that's not a real problem right now. Sure. We finally get a feel for what color or colors my opponent's deck is. I'm at 14. But the next attack step brings me to zero, so if I miss here, I am fully dead. Uh, can we deal 10? Cost 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. No. 4 off. It would be 3 off if I had the soul land in play. Yeah, that is not going to do it. I will concede. And even if I like did play this, like the Shadow Spear is a bit of a problem. So an issue here is that my Trinospheres and Chalice of the Voids are kind of weak. I could go, air, air quotes, go aggro here. Leyline is potentially playable. Blood Suns are pretty solid. I can go seven in and keep like maybe one Chalice or one Trinosphere. I can do a Chalice on zero to avoid something like Moxon or a Chalice on one to shut off crop rotations. That's not the end of the world. I don't have good inter... Like, I don't have Abrupt Decays or Assassin's Trophies or anything like that that might deal with enchantments that my opponent plays. Turn one, YOLO Palantir? I think I'm honestly fine with it. We'll take two and pitch the Spirit Guide to do this. And now we get to do this stuff. And we get to play this sub-game of, like, what is my opponent doing with these things? I never want this chalice. The Ancient Tomb is a guaranteed land, but it feels kind of mid. I think I'm just going to bottom both of those and then see what my opponent wants to do here. All right, they have milled a land this time. Yeah, this is the sort of enchantment that I was talking about, where, like, we just don't have the ability to interact with this. Uh, once it's in play, that is. Like, we can technically, you know, nether void it out or whatever. Ooh, uh, sure. Now you can you can take my mountain out of my graveyard. I'm I'm okay with that. Ooh, yeah. So my opponent has just holy fuck, uh, just like completely gone under cards like Nether Void, um, Ancient Tomb. Not what I'm looking for here. Play a Sulfur Springs and pass the turn. I think this stuff is just not what I'm looking for. I think I'm just going to bottom both. My opponent mills two. Zero cost things, unfortunately. Opponent's running hot. Oh. Uh, Life from the Loam's good. I can technically Nether Void on my turn if I have to. And that, like, slows down this sort of nonsense. Uh, sure. Redredge. Tabernacle in there. Forest in there. That's all kind of whatever. Uh, Blood Crypt is fine. Ow. So this is 16 and then another <laughs> 2 to nether void and now we'll palantir is my opponent gonna take eight i think i just bottom the nether void still oh maybe i don't yeah maybe maybe let's top top with these all right yeah my opponent takes eight 
that definitely makes up for some of the previous lines. Oh no. Um, that's nether voided. So this slows my opponent down. But they can get dark depths and put me in a scary position. Yeah. I imagine from here Palantir just draws cards. Um, that's not the removal spell that I want. I want the other one. Ow! This is why we have uncounterable spells. So this damage is cumulative. You know, it'll be one, then two, then three, but it's quite slow. Uh, Ancient Tomb goes on bottom. Sudden Edict goes on top. That is literally, like, the best card for me to draw. Okay, my, yeah, my opponent lets me draw it. We get one damage here. A theater. Uh, the, surve the surveil's not bad. So we plus here. Play my land. Uh, that can go into graveyard. Got sudden edict for end of turn. When my opponent makes their 2020. My opponent is choosing this opportunity to do their thing. My opponent probably makes me draw a card. I never want that. How is Caves of Chaos Adventurer? thing is that my opponent can just loam back those two lands and play them and then re-2020. So I don't think I keep this on top. I think I want to find another Edict. Uh, we have found a Nether Void. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and Sudden Edict my opponent. It's split second, not can't be countered. I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. Oops. Um, what was my next card? Because I just like... <laughs> lose if my next card isn't another sudden edict. Uh, okay, so let's math this out. Do I actually win this one if I'm not an idiot? So I pay four life here, I go to five. The next turn I can do the same thing again and go to one. I will deal two damage, then I will deal three damage, then I will deal four damage. Four plus three plus two is nine. That's still not enough. I would need something else here. Uh, yeah, I don't think that does it. Yeah, uh, effectively can't be countered uh, versus literally can't be countered. Whoops. Me from a week ago understood this one. I made the deck. Me today who just booted up MTGO totally forgot that. My bad. Today's video is sponsored by Moxfield.com, and honestly, they're just the best at what they do. If you need to keep your deck lists online, this is the way to do it. They have all sorts of different viewing options. You can condense that text if you like things to be tight. You can make them visual grids. You can put them in stacks. You've got all sorts of different ways to kind of view and visualize your deck lists. And they also have some really cool functionality, like allowing you to see playtest hands and even fully playtest your decks. So check them out. All right, here we go. We've got Bach. Dead? Uh, yeah, we were keeping this hand on the strength of Trenosphere, and my opponent is, like, not only a matchup where Trenosphere doesn't matter, but also just, like, led on a turn one threat that got under my Trenosphere. That's a bad combo. I think I'm going to show my opponent's card, my, my opponent cards rather than concede. I think I'm doing something weird enough that it might be kind of difficult to figure out what I am doing anyway, even if I show my opponent a few cards. Um, but it's very possible that if my opponent just follows up with a second threat here that I just can't win. Uh, conceptually, I would like to find Long Goodbye and get rid of Goblin Rabble Master before a secondary threat comes down. And I, I effectively gain my opponent three life by playing my card. Rough. Alright, so... I might just die next turn if my opponent has a red land. Am I dead even if they don't? Well, that's certainly too slow here. So, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, plus an activation, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Oh, yeah, we're already just deterministically dead. Holy shit. Okay. So, my chalices don't matter, my trinospheres don't matter. Uh, yikes. I think Nether Void is probably the best of the prison cards, but, uh, maybe we Chalice? Just like Chalice on zero if I'm on the play. That's like not great. Just uh-oh, just, just uh-oh. I am looking at an incredibly threat-dense hand here, but I feel like I need a removal-based hand to have any chance. Or at least something that plays a card on turn one. So I think I mulligan this. I don't think I'm just going to be faster than my opponent's deck. Well, 
This plays a card on turn one. Get rid of second ancient tomb, question mark? Maybe get rid of second ancient tomb. Be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Play the other three ball. Uh, this is legendary. I'm going to bottom both of those. And I imagine my opponent just sends cards to graveyard here. No, they just let me draw a card. Oh, that's fine. Chalice on zero, notably, would have stopped that. Uh, that's fine. My opponent's probably unsure enough about what nonsense that I'm doing that they just kept Trinisphere in. I just put one of you on bottom. Well, let's get this out tapped now. I'm not on the full playset of these specifically because they are legendary. Bottom that. This one's harder. My opponent's very good at taking the initiative and like they're going to have a chance to play a creature first here. But I might just need to top this anyway. Alright, they, they did mill that and my one chalice. They, they only have 14 life at this point, like between that activation and a couple of chalice taps. Like they'll probably be at 12 by the end of this turn. Ooh, another ancient tomb. Um, broadside, obviously very good. My opponent might be just throwing this Trinosphere at my face immediately for the 5 damage. Nope, they like their Trinosphere. Fuck yeah, I'm very happy about that. Um, 2 life or give up Lotus Petal. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I can still 6 drop next turn, so I think I give up Lotus Petal, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yeah. I am very happy that I get to cleanly answer this before it just did an extra Lava Axe worth of damage. So, um, long goodbye. That's probably above average. I'll put that on the top. And I do get to draw it. So, this turn could be real bad. Uh, that is not nearly as bad as it could have been. Um, I am a-okay with taking two damage here. Am I just playing a Spirit Guide? Yeah. Yeah, I think this is fine. And let's see where this goes. No. I think no to this, because my opponent's going to make me draw it. Sudden Edict, hell yeah. I think since my opponent has double Ancient Tomb, I do just kill this now, and I think I will long goodbye it. I don't know, maybe maybe I just Sudden Edict it because of like things like Rabble Master. Yeah, that seems fine. Alright, so... Amoxa still costs 4 life. That's that's good news. I guess my opponent's Cavern of Souls is like hilariously good versus Netherwood. Trash Master. Yeah, you can, you can blow up one of your artifacts to get rid of my Palantir and then do it again. Or, uh, sorry, it's blow up a goblin. Oh, this just gets to attack. That is something that I never thought the spirit guide was going to do. Send it. Six. We re palantir. Send both of those to the bottom. Uh, my opponent takes some damage off the. Or no, I milled Badlands, so they don't take damage. That's quite the gamble. They literally could have died from that trigger. Down to four. Battlecry Goblin. I will long goodbye that end of turn. Ooh. Oh, sure. Get out. Oh, uh, my opponent is dead. This is just innately hasty, right? Yep. Dargan. All right, now that is only one game. We do have to do this again. Um, and unfortunately, again, our sideboarding options are just, like, not great. I don't think I am going to change anything. Um, it's possible on the draw Nether Void is worse, but like Chalice is also worse, so I think I'm just going to keep Nether Void. Um, but again, there's Cavernous Souls. Uh. So this hand can do a Blood Sun thing, which is not really where I want to be going. Uh, we're going to mulligan this one. Again, on the draw, we're probably looking for removal more than anything else here. Or not. So what, this is five? This into this, into this, and redraw. Um, I, I might just need to keep on five to make sure that I have consistent mana. What is the number here? Three. Three's not bad. I think I get rid of the secondary threat, and I hope to play this ahead of schedule. I will need another red mana to make that happen. I will also need to not die, which is a very real concern. Blood Moon. Uh, understood. Uh, that slows me down. Um, these tap lands are going to enter untapped, uh, which is a positive. My opponent used double spirit guide to make this happen. 
So we'll kind of see how fast the remainder of their hand is. I won't have super easy access to black because I'm not a fetch land deck. I don't get to just do that. Uh, next turn's scary. 18. Yeah, my, my Blood Sun would not have been bad here. Uh, sure. So what my opponent activates this, attacks for 3, plus 2, 8. Yep. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I can win. So now my opponent activates 3... Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I am exactly dead. Um, the minus ability would have been fine on curve if not for the Blood Moon. I will concede here. Uh, GG's. All right, I'm going to keep this hand. The City of Trader situation is a little bit awkward. I'm probably just jamming a Trinisphere on turn one and hoping that it significantly slows my opponent down, but my follow-up from there isn't the best. Oh, don't kill me. Don't kill me. You just said you were a fan of the channel. You can't kill me on turn one if you're a fan of the channel. Oh, that's fine. So we're probably playing against a red-white initiative deck. So I don't need to Trinisphere anymore. We can just start playing out some tapped lands and hopefully top deck some removal. I'm still like actively going to be trying to work towards six mana, so I'm I'm not going to like intend on cycling this in this particular game. Uh, Fable, eh? Get the Blood Crypt out of the way and pass. Yeah, my Trinospheres just aren't aren't doing anything here. So that kind of makes this hand feel like a mold of like four. Opponent apparently needs mana. They junked caves and fourth Aerolingas. But the goblin is going to give them that mana that they need. Sure. Oh, there's another case. Okay. If I don't draw a removal spell, this is probably the point where I'm effectively dead, even though I'm not literally dead. Uh, just between forge and trap, it's just too much. This is our third Ancient Tomb matchup in a row, right? This is not what this deck is hoping to see. Because, like... Chalice, Trinosphere, and Nether Void are all rough. Blood Sun is also not uh, really doing anything. Ugh. Okay. Caves in. I can help contest the initiative. This in. Four card draw. I reluctantly probably keep one Chalice. Um. Yeah, this is this is fine. Like We, we have removal and a Palantir. That's kind of the, the game plan that I would like to see here. We'll just get a tapped land out of the way with the intention of Badlands into removal spell of some kind next turn. I'm not going to be very good at taking the initiative if that's something that my opponent just does super quickly. Um, do this. I could, in theory, Chalice on three a few turns down the line. Um, I think I'm just going to Chalice on zero and pass the turn. All right, sure, sure, sure. Chalice on one is fine. Spirit Guide's actually like pretty legit here because it lets me play palantir this turn while also technically holding up removal spells uh no to all that i imagine my opponent takes damage the first time x4 there's the basic white white seasoned dungeoneer you've got it this is three or less so i will have to sudden edict this one um, I am going to give up the Spirit Guide to do that. Like, I just want this mana to work out in a way where I get to potentially play a card while also holding up Long Goodbye next turn. Um, do I play you? Playing you can potentially mean that I avoid some damage. I'm going to say that that's fine. Uh, I'll get rid of the other Palantir. This is a medium card. I'm going to bottom it. It's fine against some stuff, but it doesn't answer some of the bigger creatures like Solitude and Seasoned Dungeoneer. I got a Blood Sun, which is good with the City of Traders that I've kept. Opponent opting to Scry, which makes sense. All right, there's the basic. Uh, I don't like seeing that. Because I can only answer two of these creatures, and my opponent is presumably going to attack with all three. F. Okay. So playing the City of Traders pays off here. I will long goodbye a token, sudden edict a token, but my opponent is still going to become the monarch here. 
Uh, we were very good against most threats that weren't weren't fourth air lingas. Ah, uh, awkward. I think I'm playing Blood Sun here. I'll draw a card. Um, notably, you know, this still has the can't be countered ability, as it is tied to a mana ability. I think I will play this as a land. I would like to not tap Ancient Tomb again, except for this spell. I, I think this is still worth doing. Now we're looking for goodies. That goes to the bottom. This is probably good enough to keep, or at least good enough to attempt to keep. All right, I do get to draw it. Got a 4-1 Menace Skeleton in my future that I have to respect. The Throne of the Dead 3 is also looming. Um, I'm very happy my opponent didn't have another 4th Aeor Lingus. I think even paying for Nether Void, it's still kind of a bad spot for me. Touch the Spirit Realm so my opponent will pay more. But they lose their treasure. I imagine I lose my Palantir to that. Yep. And then my opponent Monarchs. Uh, we can just play this, I guess. I guess I can play my basic instead. That's probably better. Ah, this is nether voidable. So this will cost me three life. Uh, that seems fine. I'll grab the basic swamp here. I'll play it and pass. So now my opponent doesn't have the skeleton immediately, which is kind of a huge deal. The nether void's still here. Uh, oh, that's so good. So now my opponent gets to take the initiative back, and I'm not threatening Monarch anymore. Uh, not great for Phil fans. Inferno of the Star Mounts would be a sick rip. Um, that's basically what I asked for. I probably need to minus here. And I think I don't take any damage from Ancient Tomb. Alright, three damage to your non-elemental creatures. The Throne of the Dead 3 and the Monarch are still a problem that I haven't solved. Damage report. Um, that solves my opponent's life point problem, and this is hexproof for now. I, if my opponent does not play a creature, I could edict this stuff. Long Goodbye is not the correct removal spell here. We'll go ahead and plus 2 this, which still means it's dead to a solitude. All right, no end of turn spell. My opponent will get another basic if they have another. They do have another planes. They take one. Er. Alright, I, I lose my planeswalker, and this doesn't really count as a real win condition uh, versus six power of lifelink per turn cycle. The, uh, the old six mana table of the mirror breaker. I, I think to keep edicts live, I am just going to go ahead and take out this creature immediately. But we've we've got a lot of problems. Mountain is not gonna do it. I'm gonna die very quickly. So I'm gonna take eight this turn, and then be dead the following turn. I need to answer this solitude, and the fable beyond that is also going to be a problem. Um, the looting is probably insanely good for my opponent here as well. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. Take eight. Go to five. Oh nope. Oh okay. All right, they've got something castable over there. I just go discard a land. That's fine. Uh, so I can cycle. Get one more look at something good. Oh, trap! No, trap doesn't kill me if I play this. This doesn't trample. So you're telling me there's a chance. This hurts. This puts me to three. What's the toughness on this? Seven. So if I Forge, it does, in theory, trade with this. So my opponent's Swords to Plowshares is locked under so uh, the Chalice, but another Solitude is not. So what, I gain five. Going to eight. This is still eight. I am dead. Uh, GG's. All right, so I only have two mana with this opening hand. That's not going to get me to... Well, I have three with the Simeon guide, Spirit Guide, but like I don't know that this is enough consistent mana for me to keep this hand. Like I can turn one YOLO Blood Sun or turn one YOLO Chalice. Maybe we math this out. If I turn one YOLO Blood Sun, 
It could get to a second land for Chalice. I, I think I'm just going to find something safer. Uh, all right. That's off on a reanimator land. We are not keeping up. Fuck. Uh, with the speed of that deck. It doesn't look like reanimator. It looks like it's going to be probably a mono black aggro deck list if grief is pitching shouldered. Uh, in which case, reanimate on my inferno of the star mounts is kind of some shit. That kills me so quickly. This is also probably going to be a matchup where like Chalice and Trinisphere and Nether Void aren't super good. Nether Void's probably the best of those. I lost the Trinisphere. And my opponent is going to Thought Seize me as follow-up. And I lose the removal spell. So my hand's not particularly strong. Now this is just a question of like how much power does my opponent put in play and how quickly do they do so? Voiceland's super bad for me. Stalker, yeah, so then my opponent wastelands me. I'll need a soul land here pretty quickly. Petal's a thing. It's probably safer in play than in my hand. So I've got two six drops and a blood sun that's not doing a lot this game. I had it turn one on the play, I would have shut off a wasteland and a marsh flats, and that would have been cool. So now I get griefed off. Honestly, probably just the Blood Sun. Like, it's a redraw towards a relevant card, and my opponent has 5-plus power in play. Like, I'm going to go to 18, Stalker is going to scale up, and then I'm easily on a 3-turn clock. Maybe a 2-turn clock, depending on what the next turn cycle or so looks like. 18. I guess if I top deck City into City, the Chandra is castable. Maybe taking that is okay. Do I give up the Lotus Petal for the redraw and pay two life for it immediately? Probably, but it's certainly a thanks, I hate it moment. Uh, that's not going to do it. I imagine at this point I am fully dead. This puts me to 10. I guess I could rip running removal spells. Do I have any 3-drop removal spells? No, I have Spirit Guide. Spirit Guide's not relevant versus Menace. I always take 6 going to 4. I'm going to cycle this now in case I draw another tap land here, uh, which I did not. Uh, I'm not technically dead, but I'm probably practically dead. I, I, I need a removal spell. Um, that's fine. I'm not sure that evoking grief is better than just casting the opposition agent as another creature. Um, my opponent doesn't know my deck list though, so like I, I can't blame them. Stalker scales up. Nether Void, not going to do it here. Opponent got in under all of our stuff. Ley lines are reasonable. Palantir is awkward versus what is 100% a Bowmaster deck. So what is my worst prison piece here? Like, what do I sub line in for? I am unsure. Nether Void stops a lot of, like, the hardcast grief, hardcast troll stuff that tends to happen at the end game. So maybe when I'm on the play here, I keep Chalice for, like, reanimates and stalkers and stuff and do this for this to cover graveyard nonsense. Uh... Sure... It's going to get awkward if I get wastelanded on turn one. I want to, I think, well, what if I do this? What if I go like, blah, to play around wasteland? And I just get like griefed and lose the blood sun in. I'm slightly sad. I think I'm going to play around it though. All sun one. So cards like Stalker, Dark Ritual, Thoughtseize, Reanimate are off the table. Ooh. This is a very powerful card on turn three. If I play my black source and it gets wastelanded, I end up very far behind. I think I'm just going to play around wasteland forever. I get two looks at another untapped black source anyway here. And like the sooner a blood sun comes down, the more like fetch lands that I shut off. That's the wrong timing to draw a ley line. Oh wait, the blood sun is going to make this enter untapped. Duh. No, it's all good. Ooh. Um, so this is potentially holding up a Bowmaster, which is fine. Uh, well, it's another one. Oh. 
Uh, Chalice apparently did the thing here. Hey, I oh, did have Wasteland. Now I'm a mana source away from doing the dragon thing. Oh. Rip Inferno of the Star Mounts. Long Goodbye is a fine card to draw. I don't have black black right now. I can't cast this Ley Line. I don't want to cast this because of my own Nether Void, so we'll just pass. And it's okay if we play Drago for a little while. That probably ultimately favors me. So now I can go 1, 2, 3, pay 1, 2, 3, and get a clock in play. Uh, that's unexciting, but fine. Snuff out, paying the life. Uh, yeah, sure. Land pass? Yeah. Uh, we're chilling. When I find another black mana, I can ley line. The ley line is, like, less relevant at this point. That's not a real mana source because of Blood Sun. Uh, sure. I think it's fine to play that out. My removal spells are uncounterable anyway. Well, this one is. Aha. Uh, we're chilling. Yeah, my opponent does not really have valid plays for the time being. I do need to, like, find something that wins me the game. Um, because I, I, I don't have forever. Like, eventually my opponent does have cheap enough threats that they can kind of get around this. Um, this is going to have a lot of loyalty. This is going to be hard for my opponent to attack down naturally. Hopefully they don't have some random spell that happens to kill a Planeswalker. And I can scale up with this guard. Uh, yeah, you can absolutely grief me. Alright, I lose the Sudden Edict, which is not surprising. Note that while the uncounterability is really cool, and this card does have a lot of loyalty, it doesn't really, like, scale all that favorably compared to a lot of other things. Oh, right, I have this Lotus Petal that I forgot about over here. Um, sure. I go black, black, two, and pay. And now we can keep something scarier than a Grief from getting into graveyards. And then I'll drop to 13. And that was enough for my opponent to call it. That's what I need to happen. So on the draw, do I still want Chalice over Trinisphere? Or I guess as another question, do I still want Nether Void over Trinisphere? I think I still want the Nether Void. I think that's good here. This is not enough persistent mana. This isn't enough objective stuff. I'm going to keep the Leyline Hand, though. And pitch one piece of mana of some kind. I think the Lotus Petal. I think I'll just keep the raw number of lands. Uh, so like a Stalker could come down here um, that'll scale up. And I, I'll hopefully use the Theater to just find a removal spell for that. Uh, notably, um, this doesn't actually scale up because of Leyline of the Void. Am I just going to Edict this? I probably edict it right now using this. Do I do it using the spirit guide or do I just like wait a turn? Um, let's just do this. I'm not willing to give up the spirit guide. Uh, I'm going to say no. Like that is a perfectly reasonable Magic the Gathering card that has text. But I've already made reanimate and stalker much worse by having a ley line. I'm going to get wasted. Slightly unfortunate. Oh, I'm not? Uh, cool. That means my opponent might have something like Bowmaster, and they since they didn't do it at sorcery speed, I get to Sudden Edict and get the Stalker. I guess Stalker's like not actually all that great. I could Blood Sun instead. I really don't hate that. Then that forces a choice on Wasteland versus playing another threat immediately. Yeah, I think I like that a lot. Okay, so Wasteland did not produce another body. I'll take one more point of damage for this line. Uh, this is expected. Um, my opponent's Bowmaster timing was not great there, and they recognized that in chat because they could have gotten one more counter. Um, my kingdom for like a fucking Pyroclasm here, though. Holy crap. So I'll just edict my opponent and take out one of these and get the get one of these lands into play. I think my Blood Sun's never going anywhere. I also don't really think it matters which land drop I play. 
as this game goes long, I'm hoping to work towards Chandra mana and just minus three this board. Even something as simple as like drawing and playing a spirit guide as a 2-2 blocker is pretty legit. Uh, Douthy Voidwalker is scary. I'm at 12. Uh, this is a two-turn clock. I really can't miss on draw steps here. Uh, this was good until the Voidwalker came out. All right. Uh, the shadow here is rough. I guess the stalactite stalkers can t still attack because of menace, so this only is actually a valid blocker here. I don't have a lot of time. If my opponent is attacking with a bowmasters, that potentially means another bowmasters, but I think I'm just blocking anyway. I'm at seven. Ah, oh, oh fuck. Chandra! Chandra! Not Chandra! Uh, three, six, seven, eight. Uh, I have no valid plays here. Unfortunately, I am dead. With one more draw step, I would have gotten to another void. We, we were absolutely not winning this one with these cards on top. I have kept an opening hand with Magic the Gathering TM cards, and we'll see if they end up being good. If my opponent is playing a Mox Diamond deck, Trinosphere is not going to be good. Uh, the number of Ancient Tombs that we have played against today has been uh, very rough for us. So Trinosphere is bad, Long Goodbye is also bad here, uh, and the large number of lands that I have also might be bad. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, fine. I do not want this card right now but I want to have access to that card over the course of this game, so I will be taking it. Ghost Quarter. Ghost Quarter can force me to shuffle. All right, opponent does not do that. I think I am just playing a Lotus Petal here. Okay. That by itself is not scary. With a second thing, it starts to become real bad real fast. I do not want more copies of Long Goodbye. I'm not sure... That transfer does anything. Two mana, crop rotation, thespian stage, activate is a thing. I think I just need to hold up sudden edict basically for the rest of the game. Which sucks. Especially in the face of sphere. I had the read. So now my opponent will make their token. And once they have it, I will get rid of it. So the hope here is that my opponent now kind of gets stuck under Sphere of Resistance, and that gives me time to find a meaningful threat. Life from the loam. God damn it. Now my opponent just plays one of these things this turn, the other one next turn, and I'm basically donezo. Cool, cool, cool. The Trinosphere probably doesn't help me all that much. I, I don't think playing the Trinosphere is worth the life. If I make it through this game... It's because I get incredibly lucky and just draw a sudden edict every other turn forever. Uh, that is not going to do it. All right. So once again, my lock pieces are bad. Like Chalice, Trinosphere, and Nether Void are all pretty rough here. Long Goodbye is also quite bad. It can maybe kill Elvish Reclaimers. That's about it. I guess there's Ursa Saga tokens, and this is probably going to be better than this stuff. I could board in 11 and do this. I'm not, like, the most excited about Leyline of the Void, though. Like, Leyline helps with Life from the Loam in particular, but I'll just lose the same to, like, Urza's Sagas if I am Leylining. Threat Dance? Threat Dance is, I guess, reasonable. I'll keep a Chalice. I could put it on zero early or one or two later on. Turn two Palantir. Turn one chalice on zero. Hope that's relevant. Okay. I'm very much not excited about it. We play our pedal out before our chalice. And I don't need to pay life for that. And we'll see if we end up thinking that chalice on zero was correct. For older versions of this deck, there is there wasn't actually all that much green and red mana in the deck. <laughs> sure. What did that patch? Crop rotation. Um, anyway, so like chalicing on zero and taking them off the mox was like often very relevant. Sure. Uh, sphere is kind of whatever. Um, this game gets slowed down. Okay, my opponent did have a mox diamond. 
If the follow-up isn't like a life from the loam, this like isn't actually all that bad. Yeah, like one more land drop and I just like Palantir and then I have a decent engine going. Uh, one more land drop after that, I have caves. Uh, yeah. Uh, Crucible Ghost Quarter Exploration runs me out of lands incredibly quickly because this just lets you search for basics. And I only have two of those. So this is now Sinkhole. Uh, twice a turn, and I believe that I can just concede to that. I am not going to beat that. Uh, so this is very easily an 0-5 league. All right, so where do we go from here? We knew from the beginning of the video that what we were doing was going to be an uphill battle. And the biggest thing that we saw today is that a massive proportion of the deck lists that we played against were fully able to just ignore the entire thing that the deck was built around. And that is probably indicative of the fact that, like, you probably shouldn't be trying to force this, like, squeezing of the mana and this, like, full-on resource denial, invalidate lands and spells thing as your primary access to win in Legacy. A card that I often point to in Legacy when I talk about, like, deck viability is Merktide Regent. Like, you have to be able to respect a you know five or so power creature that can come down on like turn two or turn three um that often ends up being like closer to seven power that puts you on a three turn clock and the deck that is looking to set up nether void is not going to have a good time versus that card i think the removal that i added from this original build was like 100 percent necessary and we were often like wanting to draw towards that removal. Um, but ultimately, I think at the core level, even if you like end up messing around with the lock pieces a little bit, I don't think what we're doing here has any real legs. I don't think we got a good matchup spread, admittedly, for this deck list. Like the deck that is looking to play lock pieces of any kind is just not going to be favored in the Ancient Tomb Mirror, right? Like, if we are further down the prison train than our opponent is, a lot of times, like, they are going to slip in threats or, like, I expend resources on a lock piece that they, they ignore, and so, like, they kind of get this virtual card advantage in that respect. So with so much, like, mono red moon stompy and turbo goblins around, you know, this is maybe not a great time to try that. Also, uh, like, Grief Reanimate is also a large portion of the Legacy metagame right now, and that sort of stuff is going to come in under these lock pieces and or remove the lock pieces from our hand. So the general idea of what we're doing here gets a thumbs down today. The finishing speed of Chandra Awakened Inferno just, like, doesn't hold up in Legacy either. You know, there was a time against slower blue-white control decks, uh, you know, four years ago, five years ago when M20 released, where, like, a couple ticks from this emblem was just unbeatable, but with ancillary life gain off creatures like Uro and Triumph of St. Catherine around, and with the threats getting faster, um, this sort of deck just doesn't hang anymore. And that's okay. We made a good effort of it, but... You know, sometimes effort alone is not enough. You gotta play good cards. Need to buy those good cards. I know a certain place where you can shop. That's a real good place to shop if you're looking for eternal-powered cards. Check out doamagic.com. With that being said, folks, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. See ya!